You are listening to Riverhouse Church's Sermon of the Week. We hope this talk equips and inspires you. Well, good evening, five o'clock. How are we doing? Hey, you guys can all just pat yourselves on the back. You're the, you're the most spiritual people in Riverhouse. We all know, you know, Super Bowl's happening now, and you're at church, so I think you're getting like double, double portion tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh so uh marketplace sunday y'all how was that my goodness i was so blessed i listened to all the messages this week and uh, if you haven't listened to all three uh, i would encourage you actually to uh sit go and listen to uh nikki megan and scott or uh, Nikki, Megan, and Nick's message said Scott. Um, that's Megan's husband. So anyways, uh, I would just encourage you to listen to all three. I got blessed from each one, and they both were just incredible, or all three of them were incredible, but in such different ways and carried such different grace. So I was just uh, so blessed. I was not here. I was ministering in Southern California, so thank you for those uh, that were praying for me. Uh, I had a great trip, but it's always good to be home. So uh, I'm here. I'm back in action. And we're actually going to change gears from where we've been and uh, spend about the last month talking about prayer and uh, hopefully getting, you know, some equipping in the area of, of seeking God first and going to transition now into talking about a healthy family. And, you know, at Riverhouse, we have three pillars here, which is prayer, family, and mission. We try to keep it simple, but really we want to embody these three things and not just talk about them. And so prayer is the foundation. It's the priority of our life uh, to seek God first, to be intimate with him. And then that should lead to the expression of healthy family. And we use the word healthy family all the time. And I'm going to really unpack this and actually uh, build a foundation tonight um, talking about um, basically the fight for freedom uh, and that we actually need freedom as a foundation for our lives if we're to be a healthy family, which is a community marked by agape love. Right. So we want to be to be a healthy family means that we are a people marked by agape love, the selfless, self-giving love of God. And this is not something you drift into. This is not something that just kind of happens because the world has kind of convoluted love. And so oftentimes what we think is love isn't love. What we think is good isn't good. Like we don't know. And you're not, so we're not just going to drift into healthy family. This is something that's actually against the grain. You got to be the tip of the spear. And we're actually trying to pioneer and create a healthy family in a culture of America where a healthy family is a rarity. Right? There's broken families. The divorce rates are bad. People are raised up and there's dysfunction. That's the norm. So we're trying to intentionally create healthy family, right? And to be a healthy family means we are a community of agape, a people of love, right? And love is a bold choice. It is a, a, a bold way to live your life. Right? And a people of love, a person marked by love, uh, I've heard it said this way, is that when you live by love, you're a powerful person, which means that you happen to life. Life doesn't happen to you. Right? When you are marked by agape, you're saying, no matter what comes, hell or high water comes my way, I will be who God made me to be. I will be who I am. I will live by love. I'm happening to life. It doesn't matter if it's pain or acceptance, rejection or, or exaltation. I will be love. I will choose love, right? Where oftentimes the way a lot of people live their life, it's this passivity where it's like life happens to me and I respond to the happenings of life. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus said, this is who I am. This is what I came to do. And it doesn't matter what the Pharisees do. It doesn't matter what the lawyers say. It doesn't matter what the Romans think. It doesn't matter what happens in my circumstance. I will be who I am because I am love and I've been sent on a mission. Right? That is healthy family. That's a healthy person. And a healthy person will create healthy relationships that creates a healthy family. Right? So we're going to talk about relational dynamics over the next few weeks. And um, I'm excited about uh, what it's going to look like and even um, have a guest speaker within this, um, this framework. But tonight I'm just going to lay a foundation of freedom. Because the reality is that for me to, to choose agape, to choose love in the midst of the happenings of life. Right, which can be difficult, which can be hard sometimes, which can be painful, which can be scary, I have to have a foundation to stand on. And that foundation is freedom. 
right? If I don't have freedom, which I would define as the ability to choose love in the midst of all of life's circumstances, right? You know you're free when you have the ability to choose love even when it hurts. You have the ability to choose love even when you're afraid. You have the ability to choose love even when you're experiencing rejection, even when people wrong you. You have the ability to choose agape. That's freedom. Right? Is anybody, just show your hands, you ever been in a place where you're like, you know, I, I just, I felt bound, I felt intimidated by fear, and I couldn't do the thing that was in my heart to do? Anybody? All right, we're in the right room then. Right? That's freedom. We need this foundation because the reality is if I'm going to happen to life in the face of all the circumstances that come my way, I need a firm foundation to stand upon. And that foundation is freedom. I need the ability to choose, to decide love. And the reality is that when fear has stronghold in our lives, when it has occupation and it resides within us, it steals our ability to choose love, right? We were created for freedom, and love only exists where freedom is, right? where where we have choice. So that's my message tonight, right? There's a battle between love and fear, Right, John, verse John 4, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has not been perfected in love. There is a battle between fear and love in your life and in all of our lives. And these two things are diametrically opposed to one another. And it is not until we, as the people of God, the sons and daughters of the King of Kings, face our fear that we will find the freedom that is vitally necessary for us to live a life of love. Are you lost? You're with me? Okay, so that's my introduction. You ready to jump in? I'm going to talk about how to fight for our freedom tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Nehemiah. We're going to look at a verse in chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 14. Before I read the verse, I'm going to set the stage for you. Because I believe the book of Nehemiah in as many ways a prophetic picture of the church in America that we are living in the midst of. Right? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king in Persia. Uh, Israel had been exiled to Persia. There had been a contingent sent to Jerusalem, commissioned by Cyrus to build the temple. So they had built the temple. Nehemiah inquired. He wanted to hear, how are things going in Jerusalem? In the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, he gets word from Jerusalem that though the temple had been reestablished, the walls of the city were still in ruined, and Jerusalem was an insecure city that was still very much under the influence of the occupying forces of the region. Does this make sense? I believe this is a picture, a prophetic picture of an insecure church. It's a church that is saved, but it's not yet sanctified. It's a church that has salvation. The presence has come into the temple, but the walls of the city are still in ruins, so the enemy can come and go at bay because the city is not protected. It has not yet been secured. It has not yet been established and rooted and grounded in love. It has been saved, but it hasn't been sanctified. It's an insecure church where fear still has dominion. It still resides through the broken channels in the wall. The gates have been destroyed, so fear can come in and out as it pleases because Jerusalem had not yet been established. Does this make sense? Right? I believe this can be a picture for an individual believer's life. I believe this can be a picture of a church community. The, the presence has come. Salvation has been established, but the walls of the city are still in ruins. Right? So Nehemiah is anointed by God to be a deliverer. He goes to Jerusalem and he challenges the occupying forces, these these leaders of these godless uh, heathen nations that represent the spiritual uh, resistance to the will of God, right? And he begins to defy these forces and he begins to incite the people of Israel. It's time to build the wall. They begin building the wall and what do these occupying forces start doing? Scathing threats. They start, they start speaking the voice of intimidation, the voice of fear, and start saying, if you keep building this wall, we're going to come when you don't expect it, and we're going to kill you. We're going to take your lives from you. They start experiencing this intimidation. We're going to pick it up here in chapter 4, verse 14. Nehemiah is trying to figure out what to do, and he speaks these words, which I believe are an anointed message from God to an insecure church. He says, when I saw their fear... I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. And he said, do not be afraid of them. 
Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I want to unpack this tonight. Starts by saying, do not be afraid. Don't fear. And in so doing, he identifies the real battle they were facing. Because though we are not facing physical persecution or the threat of, you know, Sanballat and Tobias, these are these leaders that were opposing Nehemiah. He's not talking. That, that he doesn't say it's Sanballat and Tobias. He says, don't be afraid. See, the battle that you and I are all in, there is an assignment against the people of God, the sons and daughters of God, with the spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear wants to come and steal, kill, and destroy your life. It will whisper in your ear and say, listen to me, and I will keep you from experiencing the pains of your past. But what it does not tell you is that it will strip your identity, rob you of your destiny, and suffocate your soul from the intimacy that you were created for. The spirit of fear is assigned to take you out. It wants to shut you up. It wants to keep you down. And it wants to rid you from your God-given mandate to transform the world and pass on a legacy. Our battle is with the spirit of fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he tells them, remember the Lord and fight for your family. Remember the Lord and fight for your family. I think sometimes this remembrance, we like, we lose the power of this word. It's kind of like, okay, yeah, I'll remember the Lord. Right? But as I was in prayer, this reminded me of a movie clip that I'm going to show for you uh, that I think will capture the, the, the depth of this remembrance, the power, the conviction that comes in this remembrance. And it's a clip from Lion King. You mostly know the story. Simba was the son of a king. He experienced a trauma. He ran away from his inheritance. And he had an encounter with the voice of his father that stirred remembrance within him. So we can, we can watch this. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Father. church today are not too different from Simba. He says, you've forgotten me. He says, I haven't forgotten you. He says, no, you've forgotten who you are. And that's the proof that you've forgotten me. And God's saying, remember the Lord. Remember who I am. And I think many say, no, no, I, I haven't forgotten who you are. He says, no, you've forgotten yourself. You've forgotten that you're a son or a daughter of the king of kings that you belong 
to the one who breathed the galaxies into existence. And what he awakens to in this clip is a realization that because I am your son, this fear of my past, these things that have been keeping away, it has no place in me. Right? Inevitably, as you remember who God is, right, in this remembering the Lord, you, you will find yourself within it. And the truth is that if you have the courage to look within, you'll start to recognize that fear has no place in your life. You'll start to recognize that deep down within you, you were created to be free. And you'll never be satisfied until that freedom is realized and possessed within you. Fear has no place in a son or daughter of God. All of creation is groaning for the revelation of, of the sons and the daughters of God who are a people who live free of fear. Right? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, and He lives inside of you. Who the Son sets free is free. You are created for freedom. And within this remembrance, you can't remember the Lord. You can't remember who he is. Remember the price he paid. Remember what he shed his blood to redeem you for without remembering that deep within you, there's a conviction to be free. You start to recognize in this remembrance that this fear, that the traumas of my past, which is where fear resides, has no place in me. And the natural, logical conclusion from that place is that you will begin to fight for what belongs to you. Where does fear root its stronghold in your life? In the traumas of your past. It's in the places of pain and brokenness. When the walls got broken in and breached by an enemy. That's where fear keeps its stand. And it resides within. And just like Simba, there's many, many here tonight, many in the church, generally speaking, that fear has come and rooted itself, diametrically opposing you right between you and your destiny, right between you and your identity. Sometimes I think we fail to recognize the intentionality of hell. Fear doesn't just come and just mess around with you because it's fun or because they can. They know what you're called to do. The enemy knows what you were created for. And fear comes and roots itself right between you and your destiny. Right between you and the thing that you were supposed to do. Right between Simba and what he was created for. That's where fear stands. It tries to intimidate you and push you back and recoil you in. And you say, stay put. Just stay put. Don't use your mouth. Don't take that risk. Don't step out. Just settle. You're not who you used to be. God's saying, remember who you are. You're more than what you've become. You were created for freedom. Don't settle for anything less. But you have to fight for it. You have to fight for your family, which to me is fight for the multi-generational legacy that is within you. You have to fight to see that expressed. And how do you do this? You have to go back. You have to face the fear. You have to face the things that are within you that haven't yet been, that where the places, the walls still been breached, where the gates are still torn down. You have to go back. You have to face it because the reality with fear is that fear, like Goliath, will take its stand to defy your identity, to defy your destiny, to defy your legacy. And it will stand and champion itself and speak a voice of intimidation to keep you passive and on the bleachers watching. You just stay put. I'm, I'm, I'm the occupying force here. I'm the victor. It will puff its chest to try to push you down and shut you up. And there's too many Christians who sit, sit in the spectators, they, they, they look at the fear, they know where the fear is, but then we just try to take verses like, greater is he who's in me than he is in the world. It's kind of like try to throw it. We memorize, we memorize this verse. No, I memorized it. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I've said it in Awanas when I was seven. You know, we, we, like, we, we like the verse, but we don't put it to practice. 
Because the reality with fear is the only way you're going to get your freedom is when you get the courage to get in the ring and face your fear head on, look it in the eyes and say, I will not let you have my identity, my destiny, my, le- it's mine. And I will not give an inch. I will not recoil. I will not fall back. I will not be intimidated. I will not let the fear, the influence of fear have any place within me. We got to get in the ring. We got to face our fear head on. Practically, what does this look like? It's very simple. In my life, anytime I feel fear, anytime something scares me, anytime I feel that intimidation, shh, don't, don't say that. Don't do that. Don't risk your heart in that way. Don't be vulnerable like that. Don't offer. Don't, don't. Anytime I feel that, I turn and I run that direction. And I dare fear to manifest, because this is the truth. Fear hides itself. It takes a stronghold rooted in the brokenness of your past. Now you come to your present, and it wants to keep you bound within your present. But this is the truth. We cannot let the trauma of our past steal from the promise of our future. The pain we went through was enough. The devastation was enough. The, all of it was enough. The trauma was enough. I cannot live and let it keep stealing from me. I will not let yesterday's pain steal from my legacy, steal from my children, steal from my posterity, steal from my life, steal from my joy. It took enough when I went through it. I will not let fear have dominion over me for my future. So what happens in our present, we will face circumstances that God divinely orchestrates us. He will invite us into situations where we get to the precipice and we know to take one more step, I'm going to go to a place where I don't feel safe and the fear is going to start to manifest and I'm going to feel out of control and it's going to be scary and it's going to be uncomfortable. That is where you have to run to. That is where you have to get your feet over the three strings of that ring and face your fear head on. And dare it to manifest because it stays hidden in the traumas of your past. But when you step into it, it will begin to manifest. And that is where the victory will come. And that is where greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world will become real. Because Jesus in you is a roaring lion and he is an undefeated champion. And he will not be put down. You will win this fight if you get in the ring. But if fear can intimidate you like Goliath did the armies of Israel, keep you on the sideline, keep you on the bench, keep you passive, you will not have victory. So fear knows the only chance it has is to intimidate, 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 push you down, project a future that's broken, scare you into passivity. If you will just find the courage and step into the ring, victory is the only outcome that will be yours. But you have to turn and run. You know, I just want to make this real for you all. Uh, Just an example that will be relatable. Uh, About a year and a half ago, you know, Riverhouse had grown. It was a wonderful first year. And then it had grown and filled up this one service. Then it's two services. Then it's three services, whatever. And then, you know, more revival groups and all these things. And I started finding that I didn't have the capacity to be as hands-on. And I didn't have capacity to know all the people and know all the leaders and all of these things. And all of a sudden, I started feeling like everything was getting bigger and further away. And I started feeling out of control. And it triggered PTSD in me, uh, where my family, my earthly family, everything was beautiful. No signs of anything from my perspective. And then one day, everything blew up. And I started finding this PTSD in me that was like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't. I don't want that same thing to happen with this family. I don't want, and then you hear the, the horrors of churches that split and nasty divisions and all of these things and bad thoughts can start coming in your mind and everything starts feeling out of control and it starts saying, don't, don't empower, don't let go. You need to tuck, you need to keep it all close. You need to keep it all safe. Sort of feeling that intimidation. You know what I did? I turned, I faced it and I started doing all the things that made me really uncomfortable. I started empowering, I started stepping out, I started letting go, and it cast me, and fear manifested, and it brought me into a about four-month season that was very, very, very difficult. I was in a battle. Fear had manifested, I felt weak, I felt overwhelmed, I felt out of control, I felt all of it. I felt, how do I know this is just crazy, Every, nothing felt stable, I was constantly on edge, I found this hyper-vigilance within me, I didn't like it. 
I wasn't partnering with it, but it was very much going on, a battle within me. And I've learned in those battles, what do I do? I know you have freedom for me. I know you have freedom for me. I just press in. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you. You're strong in me. Greater are you. You're strong in me. You can heal me. You can heal this wound. You can heal this fracture. You can heal this this PTSD. You can do a work in me, but you got to do a work in me because I will not live my life bound by fear. Four months, I probably sat in it, roughly about four months. And uh, I can tell you now, on the other side, there is such a deep, deep work of grace that accomplished because I chose to get in that battle. And there is such a deep releasing of this church that came through that and a healing of this little orphan boy in me that was still scared of what the traumas that I'd gone through, projecting them into my future. This, This work happened where I just came to things that used to cause me anxiety or thoughts that would make me, all of a sudden just started bringing this sense of peace and this deep letting go and a surrendering of this church so fully to the hands of God that I haven't, I, I don't worry. Like, I don't worry about it. There, there, Like, there's just this work within me, this scarcity mindset of, of, man, how do I protect this beautiful thing just started going away where God said, I'm the protector. It's my church. Your destiny's secure in me. I'm holding you. Freedom and love will always produce good things. What if people want to go plant a church? Awesome. What if 12 churches come out of River House? Awesome. What if, like, it's like, oh my gosh, there's no fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. But it didn't just happen, right? It was this work, this deep releasing, right? What I found through it is what I'm trying to say is I found more freedom. I made a decision on January 31st, 2010, I met God on top of a mountain. He spoke to me, and he said, Jordan, you're full of fear. He said, I have plans for your life. I want to take you to a high place, but you're full of fear. He said, you need to go, and you need to face your fear. And this conviction filled me on that morning, and I said, God, I may be nothing else in this life, but I will be free. And I made that decision. It was over nine years ago now. And... You know, so this, this, this last year with the church, that was one of thousands of decisions I've made. And I've had people comment to me often. They said, Jordan, how is it that you can steward things that are so valuable? You can steward these blessings in a way that I never feel like you're controlling them. And I would tell them honestly, it's not because I don't feel the temptation to control. It's not because I don't feel fear. It's not because I don't feel insecurity at times. Are you kidding me? Do you see how powerful our church is? You know, like last week, anybody missed me? Nope. <laughs> like, I, and I, like, literally, I love, love, love that. I was like a giddy little boy, like, getting text. I was like, oh, <laughs> these are good words, right? But, like, like, insecurity can come, like, right? Everybody, we all feel it. It's not because I don't feel it. It's because in facing my fear, time after time after time after time after time, every time I get in the ring with fear, I find freedom on the other side. And that freedom is a foundation that I need that I can then choose agape. I can still choose in the face of the fear, in the face of the insecurity, in the face of the temptation. I choose love because I have freedom. I am not bound by fear. The walls of my heart are not trampled so that fear can come in and out. I am secure and rooted and grounded in the love of God. I I know who I am because I found it. I found it. Christ in me rises up like a lion anytime I get into the fight. I feel like a lamb. He manifests as a lion. I see that he is strong in me. He does a work and heals my soul and I find liberty. In liberty freedom. That is the foundation of love. We do not drift into agape. We don't just go for a stroll in the park and just, wow, I have the healthiest relationships ever. You know, like, it's like that doesn't happen. Right? It is people who have faced their fear time and time. It's people who have stared down the spirit of fear and say, you will not steal from me anymore. 
You will not have an inch. You will not have a fragment of my imagination. You will not dictate my behavior. You will not project my future. You will not manipulate my mind. You will not manipulate my relationships. You will not alter the way that I live my life. I am not happening. I'm not just living life as it happens to me. I'm happening to life. I am a man of love. I am marked by agape. I choose selflessness in the face of it all. I choose love. That's what a free people does. And that is how you produce healthy relationship. That is how you cultivate healthy family. You don't just say it and have good intentions. You fight for your freedom until it becomes your own. Jesus already paid for it. It's a guaranteed victory, but we have to put ourselves in situations where we dare fear to manifest. It's in that manifestation. We start getting all the stuff of our past pulled up. It gets dealt with. We find healing. We find freedom. We become more like Jesus. Amen. I want to close tonight just with the ministry time. I'm going to have Helen come and, and play on the keys, but I know some of you are stirred right now and you recognize the spirit of fear it has influence in my life but I don't want it to have it influence any longer and I'm just going to invite you in a moment uh, if you'd like you can stand you can come forward and that is your declaration to yourself to God to the spirit of fear that I'm ready to get in the ring I'm ready to face this head on and I will not be bound by fear any longer. Enough is enough. As a demarcation, there is a line in front of me and I'm crossing it and I will not live in passivity any longer. I said it once, this is what I'm supposed to say it again. This is, fear comes. It whispers to you. It says, follow me and I'll keep you safe from all this pain you experienced in your past. But what it does not disclose is that I will also rip you of your identity, rob you of your destiny, and suffocate your soul from experiencing the intimacy that you're created for. Fear is a liar, he's a thief, and he wants to murder your life, murder your destiny in God. He is diametrically opposed to everything that you were created to do. And he has intentionally tried to sabotage and find strongholds in your life to keep you from becoming the son or the daughter of the king of heaven that you were created to be. So if if that's you tonight, I'm just going to invite you now. You can stand. You can come forward. I believe that God is doing a work. Thanks for listening to the Riverhouse podcast. For more information, visit riverhouseministries.com.